Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Edge of Growth K-12 um, K showcase, which is around maximising engagement in the digital environment. My name is David Linky. I'm the Managing Director of Edge of Growth. We're Australia's education technology um, and in innovation industry hub, and really we're a national not-for-profit that is responsible for building the Australian edtech ecosystem globally. Before I begin, let me begin by acknowledging country and the traditional owners of the land we gather on today. So as we are gathered today, physically dispersed and virtually connected, allow me to pause and acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognise their continuous and unbroken connection to the land, waters and culture across the country. I pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I join you today from the traditional lands of the Warrawong people of the Kulin Nation, and I add my respects to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present with us today. Um, a very brief introduction to Edru Growth before we do an introduction to um, Clickview, who are one of our um, strategic partners. So Edru Growth exists today because of the vision and leadership shown by our founding partners, Charles Sturt, Deacon, Griffith, Latrobe, Monash and Navitas. These founders saw the opportunity that exists in Australia to be a global leader in education technology. And our role really is to build the Australian EdTech ecosystem um, locally and then help it go international. And really because we believe that Australia can be a leader in digital borderless online education. Um, I'd like to welcome Jared from ClickView, who is going to sort of do a very brief introduction to ClickView for, ClickView for us. Welcome, Jared. Thank you very much for your support. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Dave, for having us. Yeah, so um, my name is Jared, so I represent uh, ClickView. Uh, so we are an educational video platform where we've got content that's mapped to the Australian and Victorian curriculums. Uh, as well as uh, teacher lesson plans and resources to help scaffold those particular videos. Um, I mean, in terms of digital innovation, we've, we've seen a huge up, uptake in ClickView in the last um, few years, um, and we're, we're supporting many schools, up to about 4,000 schools across Australia, who are actively using ClickView on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so we're here to, to support any educator in terms of video, video needs. Um, from our content as well as curating the best educational content from TV. Just before you go, Jared, what's the COVID situation been like for ClickView and your customer base? Well, it's it's been uh, it's been very surprising um, in terms of, of growth. So we've done a blog recently on our usage report. Um, so if you're comparing May 2019 to May 2020 um, and staff versus student utilization, um, we've seen basically staff go from uh, an 18% of the chunk of the videos and, and basically 82% of that being student utilization. So we've seen a huge uptake in terms of student uh, usage and digital literacy uh, for the students at home, uh, transitioning from face-to-face -to, -face to, to online learning. Well, there you go, without even trying, that's on, that's on point for message, right? Because <laughs> we're talking about engagement in the digital environment. We've got products like ClickView, which is a great Australian ed tech company that's taking um, Australian education around the world. Thanks very much for your um, time, Jared. I'd like to, what I'd like to do now is I'll very briefly introduce, introduce our program for you today. We have a, a really interesting conversation coming up in a few minutes. And we have um, Leanne Guan, the Deputy Principal and Head of Caulfield Grammar, Sorry, Caulfield Campus at Caulfield Grammar School. Leanne has led the digital transformation in a number of schools, including Kerry um, Grammar, and now at Caulfield Grammar. She believes passionately that as an educator, you need to develop the whole child. So Leanne, um, myself, and then Lynn Hay will actually be having an in-conversation session around what does digital engagement in, uh, sorry, what does student engagement in the digital environment look like? And Lynn is a lecturer at the Charles Sturt University. She's actually the director of Leading Learning Institute. Lynn has an extensive experience as an educator, a university academic, and most recently she has been working with teachers, academics and students, evaluating features of learning technologies. But before we get into our plenary session, we've got a few innovative Australian edtech companies we want to introduce you to because a, a key part of the role that EduGrowth plays in the sector is that we try and help companies as they grow and that they start to make an impact on learners both domestically and internationally. So I'm going to hand over now to um, Kim Edwards from the Education Horizons Group. Are you with us, Kim? You want to Thank you. I'm Kim Edwards and I work for Sector Software, which is part of the Education Horizons Group. So I'm going to be looking at how we maximise engagement in an online learning environment. 
So if you look at the traditional classroom where the teacher is teaching, it's often difficult for them though in that face-to-face -face model that to track individual student learning and progress. And so there's been this significant shift to this blended learning model, which includes both the online and also the face-to-face -face component. And I think this quote here from Professor Hattie really sums it up. What teachers do matters. It's not the medium in that they do it in. That's the key thing here. But from a teacher's perspective, it's very much about identifying the tools available that will give you the greatest insight into student learning and progress. And then selecting that appropriate tool that gives you that information so that ultimately you can answer these three questions. Where are they going? How are they going? And where to next for each individual student? And so Sector has a range of fantastic online tools available from just the simple ones of documenting the lesson information, the research part, the discussion forums, posing challenging questions, that communication, instant messaging component, and setting up a collaborative infrastructure where the students can evaluate, discuss and work together, and also their reflections where they can identify their next learning steps. The online submission tool is a great way to track student progress and provide feedback for learning, the folios, the blogs, sharing resources and the individualised learning tool. So let's have a quick look here. So I'm coming into normal teacher's timetable, clicking on a lesson here, and then I'm coming to what we call the student parent view. So this is your traditional, you know, what's happening today, there's some content there, some tasks they have to do, and then some homework. Or for many schools, it's about documenting the learning intention, success criteria, adding resources, and for this one, a discussion forum has been set up. So the online discussion forums are a great, great way. So this is a student view. So this is the student portal. The students coming in here, there's a discussion there. The student has asked a question. Other students can respond. And you can see that the teachers can moderate these discussions. So it's not all going through the teacher. They can step back. And it's more student talk than teacher. They can have these direct messaging communication so that it helps them in terms of their evaluation and discussion. You can also come into the marks book component here. So I'm just coming into a marks book and I'm looking at a task here and we can come into what I call that online submissions area. So the students can come and work in here. These are their drafts, but teachers can give feedback for learning. So it captures every stage of the draft as it progresses. And only when it gets submitted, does it become a summative task. So it's got that and it's also got this component, this feedback sandwich where they can identify their expectation, the teacher feedback and the student reflection. And I can come in and have a look at that in more detail. So you can get the smiley faces emojis, you can include a rubric, put in your feedback, but ultimately you can get that individual student reflection there, which identifies their next learning steps. And then finally, this individualised learning tool that each student has their own individualised pathway. The red line is the now line. You've got another marks book here. You can sync that back to sector or you can keep it just as that purely formative feedback process. So that ultimately, what these online tools allow you to do is it gives transparency to that teaching, learning and assessment process. You can track individual student progress, give them just in time, just for them feedback to improve their learning. It's very much about making their learning visible. So you can see their entire learning pathway. You can use these online tools to optimise that social interaction. You get that seamless access for mum and dad. Because ultimately you want to choose the tools that are going to help you track that individual student learning and progress because you need to be able to answer these questions as to do the kids. They need to know where they're going, how they're going and where to next.
thank you. And I'm now going to hand off to Colin Wood from Verso Learning. Thank you. Uh, Colin Wood from Verso Learning. So we're really about building excellence in teaching and learning. And I guess we uh, focus on, um, sorry, used um, by 30,000 teachers around the world, principally here in, in Australia, but also uh, the US is a, is a large market for us. And we really exist to help teachers with five core things. And at the heart of that really, which I think uh, really talks to student engagement is voice, student voice, really uh, enabling teachers to have a consistent and, and very simple way to check in on student progress and, and, and really then turn that voice into agency as we go through the, the additional features within Verso. So um, the, 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 the two components to, to engaging students in Verso is through what we call a check-in and the second is through uh, a learning discussion. And this really starts to make um, learning visible for students. And the, the important part about the, the check-ins that we run is it's about getting students to really think about that metacognition, that learning to learn piece. And so getting students to think about the, the process of learning and what they might be stuck with, the strategies that the teachers are running, uh, what is it that, I, that I'm gonna benefit from more in terms of this student experience and the learning experience from my point of view. The, the quality of that data that we start to surface really starts to put a lens on the, the, the concept of clarity and thinking about how do we design lessons and, and deliver teaching experiences that are more explicit and structured and really start to use some of those evidence-based strategies. Um, once we've got this evidence and data being generated in the classroom, we make it super simple to share that in your professional learning communities. So we give a, a, a scaffolded teacher reflection uh, module that allows teachers to think about what happened, what worked well, what they might work on next in terms of their own professional focus, but also what they might adjust in terms of their next steps teaching. And so as I said, the, the two principal components of Verso uh, sit within what we call a, a learning, a collaborative learning discussion, which is really about supporting teachers to structure that teaching experience. So learning intentions, success criteria, key vocabulary, modeling, really setting students up to be um, real active learning resources for one another. And so our, our structured conversations really support that process. And the second is about taking a learning outcome and sort of effortlessly sharing it with the students and essentially asking them to give feedback on where they are and what they might need next to move forward. So similar to, to running an exit slip in the classroom uh, where you've got to gather these things together, you've got to maybe profile the, the exit slips and think about that next step. Uh, Verso pulls all that together very simply using a series of dashboards that you can see on the screen now that really allow you to think about the impact that you're having um, and use that to then empower those PLC discussions uh, across a school or across a department. As you move up and, and sort of scale that across a school and, and through some of the systems that we've worked with, we can start to provide these dashboards to look at um, learning impact across year levels, professional focus areas, across PLCs, across subject areas. Um, really think about those networks that exist within schools support graduate teachers, mentoring, coaching, uh, and how all of that comes together. And, and, and so I guess it's really thinking about how do we empower teachers to be the best they can in the classroom. Fantastic, Colin. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. You might want to um, stop sharing your skin and put your camera on and come and join us. And Kim Ed, would you might come and join us as well? Because we've certainly got some questions that we wanted to, that have come up in the, in the process. So I'll wait for you to both click on your screen. Are you with us, Colin? Are you gonna, there we go. We can see you both now. Fantastic. Thank, thanks very much for that really brief introduction to your products. I have a couple of questions for you, Kim, to begin with. Can you explain the option to separate feedback comment from the grade or mark? Hopefully that makes some sense to you. I didn't... Uh... Yeah, absolutely. This uh, comes from the work of Dylan Williams and Paul Black. Their research has been going out extensively for over 20 years inside the black box. And what they found was that when students, when they separated the actual feedback comment from the mark, there was a 30% increase in student learning because 
What they uh, research showed was when you have the feedback in the mark or grade as one together, that if the child does well in the task, they don't even bother reading the feedback. They go, what's the point? I did really well. Or if they didn't do well, it, um, they also don't read the feedback because they take the approach of what is the point. So separating the feedback from the mark means that the child has to read the feedback comment. And many schools that use the sector system are giving kids back their marked work, but they're withholding the number or the grade and then they release the feedback comment and then the stu students are given a new marking key or a rubric and they have to use the teacher comment and the rubric and marking key to determine their actual number or grade. And so what they're finding is that for many of these students that it's the first time that they actually look at the work through the eyes of the teacher. Okay. Fantastic. Um, Colin, over to you for a second. Um, is Verso connected with Google Classroom and can you use the two interchangeably in some way? Absolutely. I mean, I think um, Verso's place in the classroom is really about understanding impact. And uh, with that in mind, um, what it's not is a, is a learning management system. Um, and then certainly what we found in the last three months as uh, I would say a huge chunk of the world has uh, resorted to Google Classroom. Um, Verso is, you know, it's one click to put either a check-in or a learning conversation within your Google Classroom feed uh, or as a Google Classroom assignment. Um, and I guess what we find is that that's super important just in terms of simplifying that workflow um, for teachers and, and, and just sort of simplifying the, the administrative burden of uh, of, of teaching online. Which is a really nice segue to another question I've just, has just popped into the chat box, which is around the time it takes for teachers to set things up and use the tool. Yeah, look, we've, we've again, try to keep that to a minimum. So, you know, there, there's two sides to Verso. One is building a learning discussion and that's definitely um, a bit more heavy lifting. It, it's really designed to coach um, teachers in constructing their success criteria uh, to think about, key vocabulary, modeling, writing stems. So that's that's really starting to get into that planning space. But the check-ins uh, we're finding is literally a case of grabbing your learning intention from your, your planning document and, and pushing that out to your students. And Verso does the rest. So it's it, it gives them the sort of, are you there? Are you confused? Are you almost there? We have some ready-made teaching strategies that we're saying, you know, I mean, what we found was really interesting. Uh, we, we adjusted our teaching strategies to fit with the, um, remote learning world that we found ourselves in and, and continue to find ourselves in, in, in the Northern hemisphere uh, so that students could say, you know, uh, what I could really benefit with is um, more clarity on, on what success looks like or how this work will be assessed. Cause I think the biggest thing that, that we saw coming through the feedback from students and, and ultimately the student voice that was coming out in Verso um, was the distance, you know, and the distance learning or the distance that was, was in the distance learning. And so having that, connection and voice from students and uh, I think was you know that clearly was coming through loud and clear that the more clarity that students are getting in terms of the learning design um, the better they are set up for success. Um, we need to be careful I, I'm, uh, you're in Melbourne as well I'm in Melbourne we need to be careful that we don't we're making comments about remote learning for northern hemisphere we may be back to remote learning in the next couple of weeks as well so we need to be careful I've got a final question for both of you I'll start with you Kim if you want to just quickly comment about how does the platform adjust for curriculum changes and you know what, what's the difficulty or challenge or speed or simplicity of doing that? We have a syllabus storehouse and so the syllabus storehouse um, it houses syllabus from all over the world because we're a global company and as you can imagine every country has their own version of a curriculum so that is managed in-house and updated so that is all, always up to date and available and then if their schools can also upload their own syllabus if they choose to and um, run that. And many of our schools do that because they have these bespoke curriculums, um, might be in Christian life studies or something, for example, that they may also choose to do. Fantastic. Colin, do you want to comment on that, about changing com with curriculum changes? Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we actually do a bit of work with, with a number of publishers and um, 
I guess we're bolted onto that work uh, be, because of the simplicity to adapt and 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 change. Whereas a, a, a book or a or a content resource is, is is sometimes less agile. So for us, it's very much about what are you teaching in today's lesson, and and that's often driven and by the teacher themselves. And and so Verso kind of is very much generated out of your your midterm planning. Um, what are we teaching? When are we teaching it? So it's very curriculum agnostic, really. Um, and then a, a big use of the product is a lot more around the sort of metacognition piece. So it's very much about getting kids to reflect on the learning process as much as, if not more than, what it is we were actually learning. Fantastic. All right, um, Kim, Colin, thank you so very much for showing us the sector and the Verso product. We'll see you at the end um, for some more questions if they come in. So thanks very much. I really appreciate it. And whilst we uh, say goodbye to uh, Kim and Colin, I'll ask Leanne and Lynn to get their cameras turned on and ready to go. And we'll uh, move into our formal sort of plenary session component. So Leanne is currently the Deputy, Pro uh, Deputy Principal and Head of Caulfield Campus for Caulfield Grammar School in Melbourne. Leanne has led the digital transformation at a number of schools, including Kerry Grammar and now at Caulfield Grammar. She believes passionately that an educator needs to develop the whole child. And Lynn, Dr. Lynn Hay, Director of Leading Learning Institute at Charles Sturt University. Lynn has extensive experience as an educator and academic, and most recently has been working with teachers, academics and students evaluating features of learning technology. So this will be a really interesting conversation about how do we engage learners in a digital environment. So there's a little sort of set P setting for this conversation. Obviously, we've all both in both Australia, but also internationally, had this challenge of moving learning online. And from where I sit, what's really interesting is that it's, I identified a couple of really big digital divides. And we may talk a little bit about that at the moment, but why don't we begin by thinking about, we, we're going down this path of digitizing our school and our curriculum. How do we do it? And what's the case for making change? So, you know, from, from where I sit, leading schools have been move, moving into a digital way for a very long period of time. Then putting aside the COVID crisis for a moment, and we'll come to that later. I want to begin by considering how do we make the case, the case for change in a K-12 school teaching and learning environment. And maybe I'll begin with, with, with you, Leanne, thinking about what are the prerequisites to buy, getting the school to buy into this process? Who are the players or you know, the actors in this story? So what I would say is that you have to uh, make the case for change and, and when you're working with young learners and those that are pre-tertiary, it's always about what will enhance what we do. How can we improve the um, learning experience and the engagement for these learners? So the tool that you choose, the approach that you choose has to um, win the hearts and minds of the teachers because let's face it, they, they have to do the grunt work. And the way you do that is to appeal to what will improve the experience for, for learners. And so before you ask them to invest in a new system or a new way of doing things, you have to make that vision and um, mission really, really clear. Do we start with the tech or do we start with the pedagogy? Do we start with the outcome? What, what in your view, what do you start with? You've got to start with what problem are we trying to solve? So you will never start with, oh, here's a new cool bells and whistles piece of tech. It'll always be what problem are we trying to solve? And then which tools will we activate to help us solve that problem? Did you want to comment there, Lynn, about sort of the, the experiences you've seen from a sort of a wider angle than an individual school? Yes. Um, firstly, I agree with what Leanne is saying in terms of um, obviously you need to actually identify that need. I think one of the challenges is that sometimes you might have individual teachers or small groups of teachers who are identifying um, a particular need that they have. That they, and there may be other teachers in the school that don't have that need. I think, you know, there are some teachers who actually have an appetite for engaging with new technologies and trying new technologies. And even in the higher ed sector, often you might find that you have these sort of champions that want to be, you know, testing and trialling and, and playing and getting their head around how, how a particular technology might meet their needs and the needs of others. But then within a school and even a higher ed sector, sometimes the approach is, well, let's get a group of people to make a decision about this. 
um, and some key actors or players may not even be involved in that conversation. So I think different schools and universities have different approaches. And so I think, you know, in Leanne's situation, obviously, you know the best way to approach this within your school context. Um, and um, I think probably the the biggest challenge I think for middle middle and upper leadership is um, listening and and being prepared to actually have some of those conversations because within a school you, you know you've got different different teachers are going to be wanting to do some things differently so I think there's some challenges there. I think it's a perfect example that's a really nice point to actually refer back to you, Leah, and seeing that you've been in the middle leadership and executive leadership of schools for a long time. So this is a really nice point. Do we need to listen to the teachers and how much do we need to listen to them? I've got a question about it in a minute as well. Well, sure. I mean, actually, if you want to be successful, you must listen to the teachers. So in all the all range of tech rollouts, but actually all kinds of change that you're managing, you, you, you start with a trial group. So in my experience, whether I'm launching tech or, or um, you know, peer observation or whatever it is, you start with a trial group, you, you, um, you make sure it links to your school strategy, of course, because uh, that's obviously an overriding an overarching um, driving force. And then um, you get, you sort of work with the coalition of the willing, right? You give them the chance to experience the, whatever protocol you're using or the tech, and then you let them tweak and change. And then you actually let them pitch the advantages as they see them to the rest of the staff. And obviously the environments in which I work have largely been big scale, you know? So you can start with a, a trial group of 10, tweak, test, and then let them pitch it to all the different stakeholders. And uh, uh, so long as you keep your ears open and you keep adjusting based on what those people at the chalk face are telling you, um, you, you increase your chances of success. Do you want to add something that, to that, Lynn? You've been nodding along yeah, no, no, enthusiastically. I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Leanne has said, and it sounds like um, that approach is a very collaborative approach. I think, Leanne, you've been involved in action research projects around innovation as well. And so, you know, you know making a very, a very sort of informed um, um, and sometimes more formal process actually can work really well. But the, the coalition of the willing, I think, is, is very powerful in school context as well as higher ed. I think it's context in any parts of of, of um, society and life, really. You know, it's nicer to work with people who want to be doing things than it is the people who are going to be um, challenging. But the fact is you have to bring those challenging people along as well, which is sort of classic change management, right? It's classic, here's what we're going to do, this is why we're going to do it, get some other people to advocate it, and then start down that path. There is a thing that's popping into my mind here before we sort of start thinking about pedagogical changes and things like that, but staying in this idea of making a case for change. I'm, I'm in, specifically intrigued about the role that students themselves play in this conversation, but also the influences of those students and that's and, and my view around what, uh, what's actually really a question around parental view of these changes and what that might make an impact and um, I'll begin with you Leanne because obviously you know you're living this every day with a, uh, an engaged parent community in the schools you're working and I'll come back to you in a moment Lynn. do you want to sort of talk about engaging students and parents in this change journey? Yeah, look, the students are very open to this type of change because it gives them a sense of agency, as, as came out before with one of the presentations. It changes the dynamic. And uh, in all the schools that I've worked in, we have spoken about the three-way partnership between students, parents and the educators. And we can give um, parents an experience of the learning and an experience of how the children are expressing their learning via technology that really wasn't possible before. And so students feel very proud. That can be a double-edged sword though, let's be honest. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, but at least, Sometimes at least, we may not want that much expression. 
Perhaps not, but we at least if, like, if it's videoed, at least there's a single point of truth, right? Okay. All right. <laughs> so um, when we when we can do that, we actually draw parents into understanding the learning process. And you know, every student is starting at a different point. And what we're trying to do is express the growth that they've shown or lack thereof. And if there is a lack of growth, well, what are we doing in terms of strategy to support? If there's good growth what does the next stage look like? It came out well before in the sector presentation. So um, drawing parents in, in a way that's not possible with one sad end of semester report um, actually creates uh, that, it, it reinforces that three-way partnership and that works really well for students of all ages, not just the little ones that benefit from that. Did you want to add anything into there, Lynn, about that idea uh, of parent yeah, look, student think, voice? I think, any, any sort of technology and um, process that involves a student engaging metacognitively, um, particularly if that is happening at home as well as in school, I think that helps open a window for parents to gain um, an understanding of how their child is learning, how their child is processing things, how their child is making decisions about what they're what information they're encountering, um, decisions that they need to be making and so on. So I think the previous two presentations that we just saw were examples of technologies that can support that kind of agency. And I think that that's a really powerful um, uh, experience for, for parents to really engage with. But then they understand how their child is um, is engaging with the learning and and um, and enjoying enjoying what they're doing, being challenged by what they're doing. I want to move on a little bit, but I will just make a comment because I know that there's quite a few ed tech entrepreneurs in this call as well. And um, having led a couple of ed tech companies for a few years now, um, too many that I need to name, it's really important that as an ed tech entrepreneur, if you've got a product that's being used and accessed by parents, that there almost has to be a referral back to the school when it comes to data analysis and interpretation, because there's a, you create a very bad environment for everyone if the parent has access to a help desk or a customer success person who may be giving slightly different information than what the school may be wanting to release or um, interpret in a slightly different way. But that's sort of enough about building the case. We need, we, we know we need to build a case and we could potentially talk lots about putting steering committees together and how that might work and the milestones. But what I'm really interested in is I want to talk a little bit more, a little bit about how do we think about rethinking curriculum plans and structures and are they important when making this digital transformation? Leanne, did you want to sort of give us an ex um, insight to some of the experiences you've had about the need to make that change up front before we start building a tech solution for a problem? Yeah, it's very important to uh, get the structures right. And the more you um, experience what a structure that doesn't work, it drives you towards decisions that will help you get it right the next time around. Um, but really, the, that, that comes from doing your research beforehand. So when you're looking for which tool, you need to re you've got to be at other schools where they've already got that tool and you've got to talk to them about your context versus their context and the decision making uh, that they've made might push you in a different direction based on your context. Certainly um, with decisions I've made in the very recent past, going to the um, conference that that provider is putting on the year before or even the year before that, um, your decision making, going and getting the vibe of the thing, what does that company stand for and how does that align with where you're coming from is really important. Um, and then I guess uh, working with the, the people that are then assigned to you once you've chosen the product, because they have worked in a range of contexts and making sure that what you're trying to achieve, uh, they understand that sort of business analyst kind of overlay. Uh, and then what I would add is that um, as soon as you start looking at different tools, you will start examining, examining a curriculum. 
and you will ask bold questions about that curriculum. You'll challenge and you'll imagine different possi possibilities based on what you've seen the tech can offer. And in my experience, that usually means you stop thinking in such a linear manner and you imagine different ways that students could access this learning and different paces that they could um, move forward at. Do you want to add something there, Lynn, around, you know, your, your experience that you've seen in having to rethink the curriculum before we move down a path of change? Yeah, um, and I, before I forget, I just want to flag the whole integration issue. So can we just consider that as well? Um, I'll put a note here, integration. <laughs> um, just to jog my memory. Um, so I think... Uh, Within the context of some of the people that are actually watching this today, David, where you've got your ed tech sort of entrepreneurs, um, what, one of the, the challenges that I found that ed tech startups in particular had um, when working at CSU in the You Imagine unit was that ed tech startups have great difficulty getting access to school communities to be testing and trialing what they're developing and getting that, you know, um, that authentic feedback. And so, um, so when, when Leanne was just talking about learning technologies, I, I was just thinking, you know, you've got your learning technologies that are, you know, very much, you know, vent from vendors that have been around for a long time. And you, uh, so you're going to be following that kind of process that Leanne's talking about, but then, there, there, there's an innovation side to this as well, where you may have a new and emerging technology and it could very well be meeting um, a need or a number of needs um, in your school. But the challenge is for the school is understanding that you are developing a different kind of partnership to that kind of partnership that Leanne was just discussing. And I think that that's really, that's, that's challenging because some schools won't see that they want to be coming along on a journey with a, a tool in development um, that's, that, that hasn't got to X point. So I think that's a challenge as well, um, whether or not that's something that we can talk a little bit about later. But so I think you've got different types of technologies that schools are going to be looking at engaging with. I agree with you and in simple terms sort of as a little bit of a paid political announcement obviously EduGrowth's role is to help those um, all, all sectors of the all sizes of the tech sector including startups and um, scaling up businesses and, and we're, we're building a, a business case for a, a, a new service which we call Clear Path um, Alliance and we, we'll be doing a pilot or two of those which is really about helping established education providers connecting to earlier stage companies to trial product in a fast iterative way that gives benefits for everyone but also has a really defined um, scale or exit point so it's either going to go as wider and um, we can talk about it now because it's a really interesting point and one of the things is and I don't uh, you, you more than welcome to comment Leanne or not but one of the things that I see is that uh, there are times in which new tools are almost hidden from management and IT teams um, in classrooms to be used, squirreled away in a corner before the Department of No sees them and says don't use them. And there is that sort of whole issue about scaling and getting that first couple of customers on board and then scaling. More than welcome to comment on that, Leanne. I'm not sure if you want to. So. I am definitely not from the Department of No. That's okay, good. good. <laughs> In fact, um, I would have feedback that would suggest just the opposite. So I'm always willing to test and try and, and, and sometimes it goes somewhere and sometimes it doesn't, um, but cautiously with, with child safety in mind, obviously. Yeah, obviously the prerequisite is that we've got data protection, we've got data privacy, we've got, you know, we're doing the right thing. But that was a point that you were making before, actually, Leanne, which I think is really important to reiterate for everyone in, in our um, session this afternoon. And you, you said it about values, right? What's, what are the values of the company that you're working with? What are the values? What are the visions? What are the ideas? And it, it leads me to a, a, a a little brief interlude before we move back to integration, which Lynn was talking about. I just want to talk about efficacy 
I want to talk, we, we, we use this term efficacy all the time, right? What is the effect of the product on the learner and the learning experience? You're, you're, the, you're the closest resident we have is to a, an academic with us, Lynn. So would you like to give us the, an academic definition of efficacy? Without just putting on the spot, I hadn't I hadn't yes. asked you to think about this. Um, look, um, once again, I think it's actually very difficult because there are many different learners with different learning preferences, different learning styles. It's an area that um, I've engaged in a, a number of research projects with others on this, um, and so there's no one size fits all. So that's very challenging when you had to ask that kind of question, David, because um, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with uh, a whole lot of individuals who have particular um, interests, behaviours, um, strengths, um, and so on. So um, that means that you, it's difficult to look at a, a solution that is really a, a one size fits all. It's more a case of how do all of those individuals actually fit um, with that particular tool. And I think one of the challenges is, and this actually came from my PhD research, where the, the concept of the personal technology toolkit, where, um, you know, if, if you're trying to introduce a particular tool to, to a group of students, some of those students will look at that new technology and go, but I can do that using X, something that I've already got in my own toolkit. And so, um, the, you really then need to be, if in fact, as a teacher, you think that it's really important that your students actually learn this new technology and use this new technology because you do believe that it has considerable affordances and, and, um, and, and so on. I think the challenge there is you then have to be able to articulate what is um, different, um, about that tool that provides, you know, a, an enhanced experience, an improved experience. Um, it could save the student time. It could um, help the students do something more effectively. So um, that's that's how I kind of view the world in terms of engaging with the new technology and how that fits. Do you, Leanne, do you have a sort of view of the, the importance of efficacy of a product before you deploy and what it might mean to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, all the things that I talked about before, that's where you start. But then is it usable? Is it stable? Is, you know, you don't, you, you can't launch something that's buggy because you put uh, even the, the coalition of the willing get over buggy problems and the ones who didn't want to do it in the first place will just write it off if it's not stable. So um, there's all of that. And then there's ease of use too. So uh, there's a product I used in the past and it was death by a thousand clicks to get to the right level. Um, and that makes it hard. And, and uh, so the user experience has to be as simple as possible because it shouldn't get in the way of what teachers are doing on a daily basis. We don't want to increase the admin, we want to reduce it. Are you looking at things like research reports on products and student outcome reports prior to acquisition of the product? Yeah, but mostly we talk to other schools. So, yes. you know, via Twitter and other <laughs> networks, we'll just reach out and say, okay, who's using what? Uh, pick the schools that are at scale. And this is the wonderful thing about education. We will back each other. So uh, at Cary, we work closely with a couple of Queensland schools with not quite a competitor school here in Melbourne. And now we're sort of like an alliance. And we, when we want a, a tweak, or rather I should say they now, when they want to tweak to um, something with how that system works, we'll band together and, and have that conversation uh, to try and get it to happen a little faster. So uh, it becomes, um, uh, I guess, a little network of users that, that back the product because they're experienced, but equally put pressure on that organisation to deliver more because we always want more. Yeah, I'll go, um, I'll, I'll share with um, both of you and with the group today that at some point last year, I interviewed um, Bart Epstein, who is the director of the Jefferson Exchange in Washington on a stage. And we were talking about efficacy of EdTech products. And I, I posed the idea that 
we talk about this term efficacy, but we don't really define it in any way. And he shared the definition that it, the efficacy analysis of a product, which I know John Hattie spent a lot of time of his career doing this conversation, is really about does the product produce the outcomes that were expected when implemented the way as designed? And it's the really important piece on the end that I, I, I took umbrage with him on stage, actually. I was like, well, that seems like you're giving everyone a bit of a, a cop out. And his analogy that he gave to me, which is really important to teachers who are on this call today as well, is to remind ourselves that whilst we can implement product, you know, if it was designed to be implemented in model A and you're doing it in model C, don't go and ask them to deliver the efficacy that you're expecting. And the example that um, Bart gave was if you went to a doctor and the doctor said, hey, Lynn, I'd like you to take this uh, prescription over the next three weeks, but you decided that actually, in fact, for your context, it's much better if you take all the pills today because you don't have time over the next three weeks and you pass away. Is that the fault of the doctor? Is it the fault of the drug or is it the fault of the user? And his argument is that all three have probably got some culpability in it. But anyway, that's a, we're going a little bit away from ed tech and use and maximizing engagement in classrooms. I wanted to move on to sort of a, a final couple of um, ideas. And I really wanted to think about individualizing learning journeys. And uh, I really want us to think about in the utopian world, um, digital products allow for internet ray of differentiated individualized programs. Like that's the uh, in, in, uh, utopian world. We've got 32 students, we've got 32 um, uh, pathways for the student to learn something. And I wanted to ask really in practice in a, in a school year, and does it actually happen? How, how, like, do we actually do this utopian world of internet pathways and infinite arrays of questions, or do we sort of still block it into different ways, different models, different learning groups? Yeah, I think it, it is a little utopian at the moment. Uh, so a lot of schools are still struggling to get their heads around you know, how much they can actually deliver online. And so um, some of the products we can now activate, some of the products we can uh, bolt on will offer some of that sort of personalised learning. Um, we'll definitely see, you know, maybe three or four levels offered for a class, um, but we know that we're probably dealing with more of a spread than that. Um, so I think that's the next, the next wave. So, you know, um, the AI that can go across the, the data coming out of kids as they do assessment and all that, that sort of thing. I mean, that's, that's not a reality in, in the learning environments that I'm a part of yet. Um, but certainly is something that's very desirable. But um, about eight years ago at Cary, we brought in a, a blended learning English program. So um, just being able to offer students a choice of four films or three novels, rather than saying, this is your novel for the year, was the early part of that, but um, there's so much more that could happen. How long ago? About seven years ago, we were quite on the front foot, yeah. It's amazing to think that it was only seven years ago, right? You know, like it's, if you think about what you've described is not rocket science, hey, here's three books you can choose from, but it's it's something that we're just doing now, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Did but, you wanna... and, and, and you could yeah. do it just by, you could just do it by moving kids from room to room. It didn't have to be yes. electronic. But what we yes. did do was build in a much more of um, students had to be much more self-reliant. It was called the labyrinth and they, yeah, they had to, to work their way through it. Uh, and some students had a strong reaction to this. There was no more stand and deliver. Uh, fascinating. Um, I'm going to, did you want to add something there, Lynn, about? Um, yeah, look, I just, because um, a lot of the work that I've, um, d that I have done with students, both K to 12 and higher ed has had sort of a more inquiry focus. So, you know, more open-ended projects and so on, things like that, that really lend itself, I think, to that in, that individual independent um, learning journey. Um, I still do think though, that there are some challenges there, like Leanne has just described that scenario with providing some choice. Um, while some students thrive on choice, other students don't. Um, and so there's some challenges there. So the in terms of the differentiating and and helping, you know, um, designing individual learning programs, um, there's a, there's a lot of there's a quite a significant cultural shift that would have to happen in a school as well. Um, on top of the curriculum, allowing that to to, to happen in a in a far more open, differentiated way. Um, in terms of technologies to support that, I think that technologies have uh, are a very 
powerful um, uh, sort of component in that in that environment. And as Leanne said, sort of being able to use learning analytics to gain a better understanding of how students are engaging with any technologies is it's probably hasn't moved in to the K to 12 sector as much as what higher ed sort of, you know, really sort of jumped in and really wanted to sort of maximize um, access to the kind of data that was being generated by each individual student. But you've got to look at that as like low, like how does, how does each teacher take on that kind of um, um, analysis for their students or does someone else do it on, on their behalf and then hand that data to them. Um, so there's, there's a lot of complexities in there, but I can see that that's certainly going to be a trend that will be increasing in higher ed, in um, K to 12 now. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to just sort of, I want to remind you that we had this idea of integration. You want them to remind you of, you, you want to talk something about integration? Uh, that was really only when we were talking about um, schools being willing to take on or engage with um, particular vendors. Um, I think one of the challenges that some um, teachers will face is that they may actually like a tool. It's a tool that might work for them and they feel that it's going to work with their, their um, students, but then um, one of the challenges is if, you, if you're going to be scaling up, like Leanne was talking about there, the implications obviously is that that tool then has to be integrating in some way into the, your, your whole sort of infrastructure. And so that's probably when I'm working with some ed tech startups over the last um, three years, I think that that's probably one of the bigger challenges for any ed, fairly new ed tech company to be trying to navigate how they can do that because I can guarantee that any any organization is going to be wanting that. I think that's true of any any technology company. If you're creating, you know, if you don't have an integration into the existing infrastructure backbone, it's just harder. And it comes back to those things that Leanne was talking about before of bugginess. And yeah, if you get technical buggy, just talk about practical buggy, right? If the fact is I can't click a link and log in, I'm just not going to use it. That's right. I, I, we're just about to run out of time. So I wanted, there are a couple of questions in the Q and A box, which I'll come to just a reminder to anyone, please drop questions to the Q and A box and we'll ask them if we've got time. If not, we'll follow up. There is, it's impossible to have this conversation right now without speaking about the impact of COVID and without speaking about one specific aspect. And I wanted to talk really about digital divide. And there's a question in the box, which is about digital divide and I've sort of had my own. So I'll blend the two together. And, and um, in, in essence, Leanne, what are you seeing from a digital divide perspective? Not, let's not talk specifically about Caulfield Grammar, but your colleagues across the sector and what sort of responses they might be. And I might come back to you, Lynn, specifically about a, a situation I've seen in the higher ed space, but do you want to talk about your experience, Leanne? Look, I think it's really complex and I see um, a range of access issues. So um, primary school students who aren't routinely working with their own device, who suddenly were expected to use a device during learning at home uh, or people with unstable internet, you know. So suddenly we were emailing kids hoping that they could pull down an email where they couldn't access the learning management system. So it's really complex and I did have the situation, as this person mentions, um, with yeah, boarding, with no, with like a mini, mini, mini uh, internet allowance per month. So how do you cater for someone in that position? And uh, it's really challenging. And so whatever you do is a compromise because that person then can't access the real time video class or whatever. So I don't have any really great solutions because most of the technical solutions rely on at least some level of internet access. Um, and so I think that's a real challenge and the NBN is supposed to have helped us with that, uh, but it's certainly not reaching everybody. And uh, uh, it's, it's a real challenge because there is no equity. And I'm very pleased that some of the universities are at least thinking differently about higher education access next year, because 
there are certainly children who who will be significantly disadvantaged by where they were or what device they had access to or whether they were safe in their household yeah there was a just before we come to you Lynn there was a really interesting digital divide which I had never thought about and one I think most people think about the digital divide um, around low socioeconomic access to you know hardware or infrastructure or you know um, internet but there was another really interesting digital divide that came out really early in March and sorry late March and early April and that was um, typically what we would call probably middle class families who had made decisions to limit screen time but so therefore they limited the number of devices at home and if you had, had gone into a Harvey Norman or a JB Hi-Fi or Officeworks in that last couple of weeks of March, there was nothing to buy because a whole bunch of people went and bought stuff because they just did not have one-to-one -one or even one-to-two technologies at home because they'd made those decisions. So uh, that will take this kind of, I wanted to talk to you, Lynn, very, uh, again, it's actually along the very similar lines. You may or may not have seen that uh, Belinda Tyne and the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Education at RMIT actually wrote a post recently, which sort of spiraled across LinkedIn a little bit. And she, she talked about the fact that at RMIT, she was not aware as the DBCE, the number of students who didn't have devices. Like they, they had to buy hardware. For, for students because they literally didn't have it. And I was wondering if you sort of have any story or context around higher education, whether you've seen the same thing in other areas and especially Charles Sturt being sort of a regional focused university too. Yeah, uh, well, I, I know I was actually part of, um, you know, working as a lecturer in the School of Information Studies when, you know, we made a decision where all of our coursework was going to be purely online. And there was a lot of backlash about that because it was like well straight away you're going to be limiting access to um, um, you know th that course if someone doesn't actually have the technology and the bandwidth to to engage in that way um, there was a point in time where we kind of bit the bullet and said that certain courses are going to be online and this is an expectation so even before enrolling in the course you need to understand this is what you need. Um, there are a number of programs available for those stu for students who may not have access to those sorts of technologies. So we have seen in the past in higher ed, um, you know, first or first year uh, undergrads receiving a device upon enrolment, for example. Um, that's one way of a university ensuring that each of those students have a device that we're, that they're going to be engaging with. Um, I agree with you about the family, the family in terms of just bandwidth, you know, in people that I was working with where they had, you know, three kids doing um, school at home, two parents, um, there was, you know, a lot of discussion about um, just slow bandwidth, you know, slow to know at particular times, especially the evenings. Um, so there were some schools that were just actually then just sending hard copy material to homes or getting parents to come and pick up some some of that schoolwork for students because it did become problematic. I don't think there's any quick or easy fix on that, unfortunately, but it's certainly a challenge. And I would think that most schools would be surveying their their family, any, any families who have students coming in um, to in whether it's a kindergarten cohort and on an annual basis to really get a sense of what access um, to technology there is at home. Often you can have, you know, whole families taking turns at using one or two devices. So I think COVID really did um, probably mean that a whole lot of school kids ended up getting their own device. Yeah. <laughs> and they yeah. were quite happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a perfect point that we can segue on. So um, I'd like to thank you, Lynn, for your contribution today. Leanne, thank you so very much. This concludes our sort of plenary session and we'll hear from a couple of other intake companies before we do some final questions. But I know, Lynn, you've got to leave. So thank you very much. If you hang around, Lynn, that, uh, Leanne, that's great. If not, we uh, thank you very much. There's a couple of questions that I'll, if you don't hang around, I'll send out to you, okay? Lynn, thank yeah, you. Thank Leanne, you. thank you. And all the best, everyone.
Thanks, Leanne. Michael Sajan from Ed Choir is now going to come and talk to us and talk to us about his product. Michael, are you with us? So what are the applications that we're getting with the teachers? That's the one? Yeah. It's time for the talk. Okay. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. We're about engagement. Can you see me now? Yes, I can, Mark. Okay, great. Um, we thought we'd improve the engagement a little bit by, um, by doing a bit of TikTok. Aren't we all in a TikTok world? Um, I was very interested in, the, uh, in Lynn's talk uh, and uh, in the conversation before because we addressed so many of these uh, issues of uh, efficacy uh, and, um, uh, and how, how we measure the uh, efficacy of products uh, as well as learning analytics. So Edquar is a, is a company that's for the last three years we've been uh, tasked ourselves with developing a real-time learning analytics uh, program for schools um, where we are able to give teachers real-time feedback about what students are doing on their computers. So if we go to the first slide, uh, Australia, as you know, probably from the PISA trials, um, has got the highest computer utilization in the world, in the civilized world, and which I think would have probably set us well for the COVID era. But um, the, uh, the, the efficacy of computer use is somewhat uh, variable. If you believe the PISA trial results, um, there's an optimum amount of computer use, which then falls off with increasing use. And uh, you know, it's several times a week in the PISA trial uh, results. So we thought, um, we thought to ask ourselves, how do we know what kind of computer use actually leads to efficacious use of computers and educational outcomes? And there is a science for that. And that is learning analytics, which is very uh, prevalent in universities, but there is more or less no uh, real-time learning analytics uh, software in schools. So we thought, well, how hard can it be? We'll just uh, instrument, uh, we'll get into schools, get into their computer systems, uh, upload from students' computers every 10 seconds exactly what they're doing, uh, applications and URLs, analyze it, and, uh, and then correlate that uh, for different students, different subjects, which actually with the actual educational outcomes of the student, as well as giving it to teachers in real time. And so that's what we did. Took three years, but now we are in a lot of schools and the teachers are really enjoying our results. Ne next slide. So what we get is we use a learning um, uh, AI, which looks at uh, student activities in real time and, and uh, decides on their education quality. Are they on task? Are they off task? Are they explorative? Uh, that's uh, on task is obviously green. Explorative is blue. Now go back, please. Uh, explorative is blue. Uh, red is off task. And yellow is the newly uh, kind of uh, appreciated going on uh, uh, their phone tethering and getting around the uh, school uh, policies to go outside. So we can, uh, we can measure that as well. So if you've got a classroom like this, most of them uh, students are on task and uh, one or two are off task, they may have finished or whatever. If you go, if you see a classroom like this, uh, which is the next slide, uh, next slide, um, clearly you've lost the classroom. Um, and uh, there are, however, benefits from this. Uh, you can actually, uh, you know, we can show you what kind of off task activities students are doing. And a lot of teachers are liking this because because they can, um, they can look at the interests of the student and uh, uh, engage those interests in order to improve their, um, their engagement and actually collapse those interests. Um, so, uh, next slide. Uh, we can actually show teachers the entire lesson and one of the interesting aspects of efficacy of computer use is task switching between off task and on task. And so we have indices which indicate just how much distractibility uh, students are experiencing in classroom. And next, next. Uh, and uh, most importantly, we can show you how computers are being used in classrooms uh, and how sophisticated the use is. Um, the traditional teaching, uh, which is really pen and paper replacement, will show up in main in, in usage um, um, bars around Google Docs, MS Word, and some school LMS. And it's a very uh, pen and paper type learning um, environment. 
Whereas uh, if you look at some more student self-directed uh, approaches to learning, you can see a much more rich and diverse uh, experience that the students are having with the internet in terms of internet research, um, PowerPoint presentation, CAD, um, and, uh, and email and com other communication softwares. So the teachers can look at this and see uh, what their, um, you know, how their students are perceiving the, 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 uh, the online learning. Um, teachers also don't have time to look at software. Our software designed to net for the teacher never have to touch it. They just, they just need, to, they just can look at it uh, uh, several times during the lesson to see how the students are receiving. Thanks their... very much, Michael. I might ask you to wrap yeah. up now, please. All right. And um, so, uh, in bottom, the bottom line is that uh, we can give teachers uh, the uh, the real time feedback as to what's happening in the in the classroom. Thanks, Michael. Hi, now, thanks very much for that, Mark. I really appreciate it. Um, we're now going to hear from Yan Yin, Yan, um, who's going to talk to us about his product. So, Yan, do you want to get going on that? I'll just stop the participant sharing. You should be ready to be able to share your screen now. And you're on mute, so do you want to unmute yourself? Okay, awesome. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yan. I'm the co-founder from uh, Smartphone Technology, uh, which is a... Um, uh, education technology company here in Sydney, based in Sydney. Um, what I'm trying to share with you is, uh, in terms of online environment and the future education, um, as we heard about uh, Lian and uh, Lin previously, there's a lot of things in around that. It can be in a very, very interesting. Uh, in terms of the, the education itself, we can see uh, this education is not the new things, and now it became an online uh, education at almost uh, the same things, you know. Um, almost the same things that we have been uh, doing for decades and decades. And now these days, uh, we are talking about and looking for into the future, uh, future education. And a uh, lot of school have tried for uh, um, many, many different ways to do that. And then getting to 2020, we can see the COVID-19 pandemic. It became almost, you know, impact on everyone. Almost everyone's daily life, you know, um, were involved in certain, certain level of online life. However, have, uh, to having said that, we can see there's a lot of frustrating uh, in terms of online schooling. Our parents, kids, even parents, they must say, oh, how can I jump into, uh, 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 jump from this platform to other platform, using this tool to other, other tools. I do have some teachers in a complaint of, of that. Uh, I using blah, blah, blah meeting system, then I need to get out of that and using other platform to send out homework to, uh, to our kids. And then I cannot come back to catch my uh, students. So what happened is, uh, for me, I would say that is a sort of, you know, uh, the very old uh, issues, which is two separate schemes. One is education itself, and the second is the technology. So how to fix this one, uh, from my point of view, is try to uh, close the gap by understanding school education. Uh, normally, when a uh, educa uh, technology company they doing things or design some things, they might not have enough knowledge or insight uh, understanding of education, particularly school education. Therefore, we need to we need to know understand that school education, in fact, they request a more secure and a safe environment. Yesterday, I tried to do a visual. Uh, conference room uh, to do with uh, some test with someone else and suddenly some stranger jump into there and it's going to be very very you know serious incident if that happened in the, in the school. Therefore a uh, secure, uh, secure and a safe environment is very important things um, and uh, secondly uh, because it will be the online, uh, the online uh, schooling which means students will spread everywhere in their own environment so that can be impact or, or influenced by many different kind of thoughts. So how we can attract their uh, concentration. So immersive environment will be, will be something that engage learning mod motivation. 
and again, an open space with a rich resources to stimulate their creative and critical thinking, as what Lin and, and uh, uh, Yen said before. Uh, so, uh, hi, hi Yen, I'm going to ask you to start wrapping up, please. Okay, I'm going there. And to do that, the main thing is we need to raise up our new digital citizen. Thank you, Yen. Are you there? So that I'll school you there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yen. I really appreciate that. What I might do is I've got um, some questions here also for um, uh, Michael. Michael from Edquire. If you want to come and join us again, we've got some questions here. So. Um, Yen, before we, before Michael, Michael Michael join us, thank you very much, Yen. There actually is a question here is, and, and the question for you, Yen, is can you use your content on other hardware? Yes, Yen? indeed. We can do that. Yes, yes, we can do. Um, because as a platform, we uh, combine different And to provide school. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I can't. I'm sorry, uh, we've lost we've, we've lost connection to you. We've got pretty significant connections with you. So just, uh, I'm sorry, I missed all of that. I might have to move on. Actually, Michael, I just wanted to ask you. There was a fantastic question in the chat box. Maybe the person got scared and has taken it back, but I I, I remember it. So I want to ask you what it is because I can remember what it was. And it, the question was, is this big brother coming into the classroom? <laughs> I wanted to ask you that one. This person got scared and ran away. Uh, well, I think we've already got big brother in our classroom in uh, you know, Google and Microsoft and every, every application that we use in classrooms, they collect data on us. I mean, the difference is that we don't use it to sell stuff to you. We, we, we collect the data entirely uh, you know, to help, we give the data to students. One of the things I didn't talk about was that we've done a, a trial where we give students a portal to their own engagement data and they've halved their off-task times. So our data is entirely for the student benefit. We don't sell it, we don't do anything else with it. Um, and, and can I just ask, can you just give us a very brief insight to how it's collecting the data around how it's tracking the engagement and disengagement? Yeah, so we, we collect the data every 10 seconds as to, in, as to the application, the, uh, the tab, uh, titles and, and uh, URLs that the students on. We use an AI engine which has learned over the years what is education, what is on task and what is not. Teachers also enter um, what they, the topic of their lesson, which we use in the engine to decide whether a student's on task or not. Um, and then we simply uh, show it to the, uh, to the teacher in a color-coded uh, um, semaphore way so that the teacher doesn't have to, you know, read anything. They can just see the color. And the a final question I'll, I'll, I'll put to you as well, Michael, and, and Yen, if you're, if you're connected back with us, we can certainly ask you as well. And the question really is, considering the possibility of schools closing and reopening with COVID-19, um, how does your solution support teachers and students that they transition between face-to-face, -face, online, and in that, that sort of hybrid model? Michael, did you have a comment on that? Well, I think, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, with my discussion, we, we, I talked with John Hattie about this, and, 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 and uh, the, the uh, Gonski, too, as well, says teachers need feedback. They need real-time feedback, not at the end of the term. And so, uh, you know, getting feedback from a home environment is even more challenging than in a classroom. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we've actually ported our system so that it can operate outside of the classroom as well. And it's got challenges because you've got to be careful about privacy. You've got to make sure it's only collecting during lessons and not outside of lessons and so on. Technologically challenging. But we can give the teacher real-time feedback. I mean, a teacher doesn't, is not watching the camera and watching the students every minute of the day. They may have to turn around and do other things and go, walk off and give them a task. Uh, we can continue to support the students while the teacher's not looking, while the teacher's not glued to the computer. When he comes back, he can see which students are engaged, which ones have, you know, are wavering and, and have lost their way. And so that's how we support that home environment. Fantastic. Um, there are no other questions in our chat box. So what I am going to do is I'm going to I'm going to give everyone an early mark. We're going to finish a little bit earlier. So what I'd like to do is firstly thank you, um, Yen. 
Michael, I'd like to thank our other um, pan, um, other companies that pitched today, Kim from uh, Sector and Colin from Verso. So thank you all for contributing to the today's session. I'll, in absence here, I'll thank Leanne Gon from Caulfield Grammar and I will thank Lynn Hay from Charles Sturt University. And thank everyone who came along today. What we'll do is we'll cut this up, we'll put it on our website. So thank you all very much for being here. Have a great evening.